Welcome to Worldview Matters, discussing controversial issues, discerning current events, defending biblical Christianity. No topic off limits. And now, here's your host, David Fiorazzo. Friends, I know I've been saying this a lot lately. First of all, thank you for watching, listening, and sharing the podcast. We've got another troublemaker for the kingdom of God that uh, special treat for you again today. Uh, Paul Blair, former NFL player, now pastor, libertypastors.com. He's the senior pastor at Fairview Baptist Church Edmond, Oklahoma. I've been there. Great church. Wonderful people. Liberty pastors equip and train men of God to go back and equip and build up their congregation so they can go out into the world and try to get some uh, some sense going on, some righteousness and, and influence of Christ into our culture that really needs it because it's in chaos. But I want to bring in Paul Blair right now. Brother, so good to see you. Thanks for your time today. David, it's always a pleasure to talk with you. It's been too long, but I'm glad I can uh, glad I can make it all fit today. Thanks yep. for having me on. Yep, you're welcome. Now, this is a new audience here since we talked last on a previous show. So, you played with the Chicago Bears. You were uh, a lineman, and you were with was it Walter Payton and some of these guys? And did you go to the Super Bowl? No, that's a sore subject. I <laughs> won the Super Bowl in. Uh, January of 86, and I was okay. drafted in April of 86. Oh. So I was one of three rookies to make that defending world championship team. Wow. And as you can see in the in the background behind me, of course, you know, McMahon was one of my teammates. Peyton was a teammate. And uh, the tragic thing is I was sitting here having to endure Green Bay, still being <laughs> alive a couple of weeks ago, was back in 19, or 1986. We were playing Green Bay as my rookie year at Soldier Field, and Mac threw an interception. And Green Bay had a had a, a thug for a nose guard named Charles Martin. And <laughs> Charles Martin, uh, and this is this serious fact, you Google search it, you'll find it, You'll it'll blow your mind. <laughs> Charles Martin came up behind Jim McMahon, picked him up, bear hugged him, picked him up in the air, and then just drove his shoulder into the AstroTurf. And that was the end of Jim's season, and really the end of our chance to have a dynasty. You know, wow. McMahon was out for the rest of the year. We went 14-2 and two my rookie year, but got beat in the first round of the playoffs because we had Doug Flutie as a quarterback of all things oh my for goodness. a period of time. But, but yeah, it was, the, it was the most, it was the cheapest of all cheap shots that wow. I've ever seen and had nothing to do with football. Literally just came up behind him, bear hugged him, picked him up and drove him into the tur after turf. And it, and it was basically the end of, of, who knows how many Pro Bowls Jim would have gone to wow. if it hadn't been for that and how many Super Bowls we would have gone to. But you're the one that. that brought this up, David. You I picked a just scab. Left us alone. I know I picked that a scab, <laughs> Paul. I'm sorry. No, but I remember I didn't remember that until you just brought that up and I'm going, wow, that did happen. Yep. But anyway, and Jim McMahon ended up backing up Brett Favre in Green Bay. Yeah, Jim, he wound up going to San Diego and then yeah. uh, finished up there in Green Bay. Yeah, he got – and he still had some game in him, but Jim was a competitor. I mean, he was really yeah. a brilliant football mind. Uh, yeah. He was just a wild guy off the field, but he was a brilliant football player and had the mentality of alignment. I mean, he was like uh, he was like Josh Allen for the Bills. I mean, he would throw oh, his boy. body around and wasn't afraid of contact. So, yeah. uh, sadly, uh, sadly, that – uh, people wonder, they look at the 85 Bears and they say, well, that was one of the greatest teams of all time. Well, we should have had a dynasty. Mm -hmm. And and uh, sadly, the, the injury with Mac is the reason we didn't. Yeah. Well, what, one of the things I want to talk about is football, even though I had you on as, you know, Liberty Pastors. We wanted to mention the events coming up. What, my pastor went to one a couple of years ago. Phenomenal, uh, these training sessions, these boot camps for pastors to go home and just equip their congregations. But I'm looking at coaches and NFL players that are praising the name of Jesus and glorifying God, and I'm really thankful. I'm looking at this Sports Spectrum post that's got Ravens, Baltimore Ravens head coach John Harbaugh sharing about servant-type leadership that reflects Jesus. And I know he's offending some people, and then you got Jim Harbaugh, and I want to just share this headline over at CBN News. Michigan head coach Jim Harbaugh reveals mini revival, 70 players baptized last season. So, Paul Blair, what's going on? I mean, these, I'm thankful for these guys, and uh, I just would love to hear your take on that. Well, you know, it's exciting to see the name of Jesus proclaimed ever, anywhere. 
and to see mm-hmm. some of these phenomenal athletes and you know you can tell when a guy is just you know saying hey thanks to the big guy upstairs mm-hmm. versus someone that really talks with knowledge of having a relationship with Jesus and it's so encouraging because you know we live in a, a, a sports intoxicated world and especially in America yeah so for these young men that are growing up in in, in our world today and many of them uh, you know without a father in the homes, be able to have some real bold, strong, tough guy men that have gentle, sensitive hearts and are surrendered to the Lord mm-hmm. is a great evangelistic tool and a great outreach to uh, all of the youngsters growing up in our country. So yeah. I'm thrilled. I, I don't know John Harbaugh personally. I've always mm-hmm. liked the guy. I like his demeanor. Uh, mm-hmm. Of course, Jim and I were teammates for two years when he was drafted out of Michigan. But, you know, that was eons ago. That's 40 years ago. So I haven't talked to him in ages. But to hear those kind of testimonies, and quite frankly, this quarterback from uh, the the, uh, the, uh, Texans. Yes, um, C.J. Stroud. I know very little about that young man prior to his uh, rookie year, but he seems to be an incredible uh, kid. And, of course, his great passion and his love for Jesus that just Mm -hmm. bubbles out when he's on on cameras is great. Yep, I'm glad you brought that up because – Even after losing, he won one playoff game, glorified Jesus Christ. By the way, NBC, you know, censored that out, the Jesus part. And then after they lost the next game, C.J. Stroud said, I just really want to praise my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he you very rarely hear that in a loss. But that platform he's using his platform to glorify God, Paul. And you know what? The name of Jesus is offensive to the lost world. And you know, yeah. you listen to all these uh, these sports guys or, or musicians or whatever. They talk about faith. You know, we're people of faith. Yeah. What does that mean? I mean, mm. what does people of faith mean? I mean, everybody has faith in something. You know, atheists have faith that there is no God. You know, so we're, we're all people of faith to some degree. And, of course, the journalists are happy to have you talk about Allah or any yeah. other you know, higher power or the man upstairs. Yeah. But as soon as you bring up the name of Jesus, you can just see that they get uncomfortable and they're ready to cut to a different camera. So I love the fact that they're having having it from so many different directions. You know, yeah. you can't just get rid of Strauss. You can't just get rid of uh, Harbaugh. I mean, there are so many of these great coaches and players that are, that are out there sharing their testimony yes. to the world. So it's a phenomenal time for Christianity. Yeah, we're just, we're just yeah. We're just mentioning a few because, I mean, the Harbaugh's are in the headlines yeah. now. Jim, sure. uh, college cha- the national championship with Michigan. Now he's going to be coaching San Diego. Uh, John Harbaugh is going to the NFC championship game with the Ravens. But there are players and coaches across the country. And uh, discipleship can happen. We think of sports as just entertainment, but we forget these are young men of God. And some of them are very influential with their platforms. I, Paul, I want to go back to the Philadelphia Eagles, the year they won the Super Bowl. I studied that year. I was watching their chaplain make disciples. I, I remember they had a game down in Jacksonville, Florida, and in the hotel pool, they were baptizing players and converting young men. And uh, Nick Foles, who won the Super Bowl, went on to be a pastor. There's Zach Ertz and all these other guys. Uh, Trey Burton, didn't he end up with Chicago? These were Christian men that were, after that year, they were sent out. But it takes a chaplain and it takes some leaders. Go ahead and share your thoughts on that. Well, uh, I tell you what, it's such an encouragement to see this revival that seems to be taking place because, you know, Back in the day when I was playing, you'd ha- everybody would get up and, you know, just before kickoff, everybody was on their knees. You know, God, help me. Help me to win today. <laughs> help us to win today. Help me to play great today. And then immediately after the game was over, it's like, okay, God, you can take the week off. Uh, I'll see you again next Sunday for kickoff. Hmm. Uh, so there's that type of so-called faith. And then there's what we're seeing with these young men. And I tell you what. Uh, to, to see the testimony of like Foles with what happened in Philadelphia. Yep. And of course, there's a number. There was a number of strong believers on that team. But seeing just the influence that one one man who's bold and unapologetic and the real deal, the the amount of influence that one man can have in his work environment, yes. whether it be down at the office building or in the locker room, is amazing. And it also should just go to show us that it's all about the Holy Spirit. 
We just need to be faithful in standing up for Jesus in everything that we do. And it's up to the Lord to to light fires or not. So it, it's just amazing to see the work that's being done and who God is using to uh, advance the work of the kingdom right now. Amen, brother. And we're going to talk about Liberty Pastors in a minute and just some of the things I found on a page on called Next Steps for Pastors. I, I like some of these things. We'll talk about some of the principles. But before we do that, we're going to transition by just reading the verse that John Harbaugh quoted after the game last week when they won going to the championship game. He said, First Chronicles 29, 11, Greatness, power, glory, victory, and honor belong to you because everything in heaven and earth belongs to you. The kingdom belongs to you, Lord. You are the head and ruler over everything. And so, Paul, that uh, it sounds like that's a man who knows his position and knows who is in authority, right? Well, it's pretty impressive that you've got an American Christian that's actually looked at the new te- uh, the Old Testament somewhere. <laughs> You know, <laughs> most most American churches just think it's a placeholder to even get to the Gospels. But it's a, it's a, it was encouraging to see that and that it was a, a verse out of Second or, or Chronicles that that Harbaugh latched on to to use. So that's that's a good sign as well. <laughs> that's funny that you say that. Pretty good transition though, because that's what you do at Liberty Pastors. It's the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation, the whole counsel of God. And you say the first point is to pastors. You must be committed to preaching the whole gospel, not just the parts that people want to hear. And some people just are more comfortable with the New Testament. And um, that's an, for a whole other story. They avoid Bible yep. prophecy. They avoid revelation. But, Paul, you've got an event coming up in Georgia. I would love for you friends watching and listening to get this to your pastor and tell him this is an opportunity to go and be fully equipped with an arsenal to bring back to your home church. Paul, share about what's happening at St. Simmons Island, Georgia, February 26th through the 29th. Well, David, you you mentioned it, and really what makes Liberty Pastors so different? You know, we've had groups for the last 50 years trying to awaken the pulpit, recognizing what kind of an influence the body of Christ could have on our culture. And you know, you don't have to look far in the Bible to see what happens when there's an on-fire church. Mm-hmm. You know, you look and look at Acts and see the influence that that church in Ephesus had on their community. And then when you consider that Ephesus you know, was the headquarters of worship of the great Dionysus. I mean, it was a tourist attraction. You had pagans from all over the world coming there to worship this pagan god and participate in some of the deviant sexual behavior that went along with it. Yet you had this body of Christ, these Christians, that had such an impact on their culture and their community that it wasn't long until the Silversmiths Guild was complaining to the city council, saying, we need to get rid of these Christians because they're hurting business. People aren't <laughs> coming to the Temple of Diana anymore. People aren't buying the little silver shrines. And, and we think that our faith shouldn't affect the culture. Baloney. Mm. Genuine faith can do nothing but affect the culture. The illustration a moment ago of the locker room in Philadelphia, when you bring in you know one or two on-fire Christians, and what their genuine testimony, how how it affects the others in the locker room. Well, see, the problem that we have with pastors in America, David, is most pastors have been taught in seminary that if they ever talk about something political or talk about the realm of civil government, that they're sinning. So, you know, you got these guys that are well-intentioned that they've never thought that through, but they think, oh, if I talk about economics, if I talk about uh, 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 biblical civil government, that I'm sinning. Well, it's actually the exact opposite of that. And the Bible doesn't begin and end in John 3. You know, God's word begins in Genesis Amen. 1 and ends in Revelation 22. And it's one author in one combined message. So we teach pastors to think biblically about areas of life where they've been taught not to think at all, much mm. less to think biblically. And we open up with a question. We ask pastors, what area of your life or what part of your life is Jesus not the Lord over? (laughs) And we tell them, make that list. And whatever that list is, those are the only subjects that you aren't allowed to speak about in church. (laughs) But we know that Jesus isn't just the Lord of Sunday morning. We know he's supposed to be the Lord of all. So everything we do, as Paul said, we should do to glorify God. So 
the how we handle money should be different than how a lost person handles money. How our homes look and function, the relationships that we have with our spouses, how we raise our children, mm. our business ethics as business owners, our integrity and honesty as mm. employees. Everything we do should be done to the glory of God. Mm. So Amen. that's what we introduce pastors to thinking about. And it's very simple. Again, we ask that question, what areas of life is Jesus not Lord over? Those are the only things you can't talk about in church. <laughs> Immediately, they understand. They get it. Yeah. They recognize that we've been duped. And then at that yeah. point, we begin to pour into them, what does the Bible actually have to say about the role of self-government? When you compare it, to, I'm sorry, of civil government, when you compare it to self-government and church government and family government. So we teach them what the civil governing authority is supposed to do, and more importantly, what the civil governing authority is not supposed to do. Then we teach them to start thinking biblically in the area of economics. Quite frankly, one of the great sins of our generation is leaving destitute our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren. You know, the idea of having $34 trillion of debt, of spending someone else's money and just mm. handing it, to, putting it this burden on our kids— is as ungodly as anything that we're doing, mm. but you don't hear pastors talk about it because they've been taught not to talk about it. So we free these pastors up to recognize that we're not supposed to make church members. We're not supposed to make converts. We're supposed to make disciples. Amen. We're supposed to make followers of Jesus. Well, where do we follow Jesus? Just on the way to church on Sunday morning? No, we should be following Jesus in everything that we do. So what does the Bible have to say? What is the Lord's commandments in us in raising our children and being a good husband or being a good wife or being an honest business person or how we handle money or the realm of civil government? All of this the Bible deals with, but most pastors have been taught to either ignore it or read over it until they can get to John 3.16. Mm. <laughs> well, John 3.16 obviously is cornerstone. Without, without bending your knee and trusting Christ, you're never born again. Your new life doesn't begin. Amen. But that is just the beginning. Once you're a follower of Christ, then it's important to follow Christ. Yes. So that's where the discipleship comes in and why our camps are so different than everything else and why they're so important. Yes. Impacted my life. I've told you my testimony before. Maybe I'll share a little bit when we come back from our break. We're with Paul Blair, libertypastors.com. We'll be right back on Worldview Matters. Today's show is brought to you by Harbinger's Daily. World News Biblically Understood. Stay informed at harbingersdaily.com. Friends, if you're listening to the podcast via audio, uh, please help us out by leaving a five-star review. I guess that helps us rise in the show rankings and uh, search engines or something like that. Also, we're looking for more sponsors. If you'd like to sponsor the show, we are open to having you come on board. So go to worldviewmatters.tv and send us an email. So Paul Blair, um, I went to a Liberty Pastors conference, actually two of them, one in Texas, one in Edmond, your hometown. I was just so impressed, so touched. But the first one I went to in, I believe, 2020, it, it really was a catalyst in my life. Um, it, I was feeling kind of like a Lone Ranger where I was, and I think I was an associate pastor at a church at the time, and just feeling like, man, where are the people that want to live out this faith and make a difference in our culture and touch on these controversial issues? And then I go there, and man, I was filled up. And yeah, you're right. It's the fire hose. But I want to ask you one thing real quick. It's only $99 for a pastor to go for three days or four days at a, at a very nice resort and get the meals all taken care of. Please tell us how that works, because when you go to the website, there are some pastors that will look at it and not believe it. <laughs> well, you can find everything on our website, libertypastors.com, libertypastors.org. And of course, as you've said, our next one is going to be at, uh, I guess, I see the St. Simmons or St. Simons, uh, but uh, at the Sea Palms Resort there. Uh, we've been told it's beautiful. Of course, we've got affiliates that we work with in Georgia, and we literally are going to basically be renting out this entire resort. And it's for a number of reasons. You know, one reason it's for pastors to come and have a little second honeymoon, uh, give them a, a few mm -hmm. days of R&R &R, uh, with their wives. 
then we want them to develop uh, relationships with other pastors in their state or community or strengthen those relationships. And just as you said, David, when you realize that you aren't the only one that's out there, it's yeah. quite encouraging when you find that there are hundreds of pastors in your own state, much less thousands yeah. across the country that recognize that something's wrong, that something needs to be addressed and fixed. Well, it's quite encouraging. And then we pour into them and teach them. But this is po made possible by, well, for example, uh, Patriot Mobile is one of our mealtime sponsors. Uh, and, you know, Charlie Kirk and, and Turning Point Faith also works with us. Uh, we've got... Um, um, uh, mychurchfinder.com. You want to find a church that has a biblical worldview, you can go there. They all work and sponsor meals. But most importantly, you know, one of the best friends I've had in life, uh, a guy by the name of Art Alley. I met Art about 15 plus years ago at an event in, in Texas, and we became immediate friends. But Art's the founder and president of a, a mutual fund group called the Timothy Plan or the Timothy or Timothy Partners. And what they do is they allow Christians to invest in the market without investing in companies that are anti-Christian. Mm, you know, so you can invest, for, for example, like our, your cell so, so service, rather than using Verizon or AT&T, which promotes abortion and promotes the LGBT agenda, you can work with, with Patriot Mobile and Glenn and all the great staff there, and you can have great service and be supporting a Christian company that advocates mm. kingdom principles. So Art Alley and Timothy Plant are the reasons that you can enjoy basically a $1,500 trip for 99 bucks. Yeah. But in return, we ask you to give us 20 hours of your time. And you've got evenings to yourself. You've got plenty of time to enjoy the facilities, but uh, 20 hours of continuing education. And I promise you, David, as you know, we've not had anybody. I've not had one single person that came up after the fact and said, I wish I hadn't been here. <laughs> it's amazing the testimonies that we've had. Yeah. Yep. In fact, let me let, let me share one of our pastors sure. uh, down in, in Nueces County there in Texas. They had a Soros appointed uh, district attorney. <laughs> and we had a group of pastors in Nueces County that started working together. Now, can you imagine a group of churches, even from different denominations, that come together as part of the body of Christ? And they started actively engaging their community and working with one of our partners, CDF, or Citizens Defending Freedom. They wound up challenging this Soros-backed district attorney and having him resign from office because of their effort. So that's a win for the good guys. But here's where it gets even better. It's not just about politics. It's about the glory of God in every facet of life. One of the lieutenants for one of the crime families down there, of course, these, these uh, uh, Mexican drug lords that are going back and forth across the border, got gloriously born again in the middle of all this. <laughs> Next thing you know, about half of his gang gets born again. And then some of the other member gangs and these drug cartels that six months ago were purely on the side of Soros and Satan, which, by the way, I've never seen Soros and Satan in the same room at the same time. They may be one and the same person. <laughs> anyway, never mind. But, but to see all these members of a drug cartel come face to face with Jesus and accept Christ as their Savior. Wow. That is a permanent change. Amen. And it's just that kind of, of thing that we're looking for with Liberty Pastors. Obviously, uh, politics is downstream of culture. Mm. So we want to we want to affect the whole culture. We want to see people saved. And then what what comes out of that is biblical thinking in every area of life, which results in the blessings of liberty that we have enjoyed here in our country. Yes. Amen. We're, you are trying to get pastors to go back and help their congregations influence culture rather than what we've seen in, in the past decades, the, the culture influencing the church. Paul, I just want to mention some of the people that are speaking there at this next one. Um, we've got Dr. Rick Scarborough, which I've talked to, Alex Newman, one of our colleagues here at Freedom Project, uh, Dr. Lee Merritt, Dan Fisher, Brigitte Gabriel, Matt Staver, Stefan Broden, Dran Reese, she was just on with us a month ago, Rick Green, uh, Dr. Cal Beisner. My goodness, you've, you've got some heavy hitters. And so, Pastors are really going to be 
equipped even more than they've ever been. But I want to go through just a couple more points because in the, what I pulled off your website, because we only have a few minutes left. I love this. Gotcha. Number five, truth and liberty must be more important to you, pastor, than comfort and approval. That's huge. Let's just end with that one because a lot of pastors, we'd love to have the approval of everybody. If you're living for Christ, it's not going to happen. And if you're preaching the whole council, go ahead, Paul. I understand what we're facing now is not new. You, know, you go back and look at Jeremiah. And there Jeremiah yeah. was called to a very miserable ministry. Oh. And he was standing up trying to point his people to the truth and point his people back to God. Well, in the same room and generally outnumbered, you had, of course, the Bible just calls them false prophets. But, you know, what were you think these guys were wearing signs and said, I'm a false prophet. Don't listen to me. No, they're out here trying to persuade the king and persuade the people to follow the path of evil. And they claim to be speaking for God. And then there's Jeremiah, who's actually speaking for God. Well, you know, Jeremiah wasn't applauded. He wasn't given a key to the city. Quite frankly, they wanted to kill him. They wanted to imprison him. They hated him. So we've got to recognize that when we stand up for Jesus, it's going to be very rare that we're going to be standing with the majority. Amen. But Jesus said that, you know, there's a narrow road that leads to eternal life and a broad road that leads to destruction. But we've got to recognize that our calling is by Jesus and it's for Jesus. Yes. And if you think you're going to win man of the year by serving the Lord in ministry, well, you better recognize that it ain't going to happen. Hmm. Uh, but one of these days, our goal is to hear a well done, my good and faithful servant. Amen. So we as pastors got to recognize that we're accountable to the Lord only. We, we play to an audience of one, and that's Jesus. Carson Wentz has a foundation called Audience of One, by the way, AO1. Um, we got to let go of the cruise ship mentality and our comfort, and we got to get on the battleship. We need brothers in arms. And Paul, I know you're a kindred spirit, brother. That's why I love talking with you. Uh, if you're in uh, Edmond, Oklahoma area, check out Fairview Baptist Church, and we encourage you to get this website to your pastor, libertypastors.com. Paul, Lord willing, sooner we'll be talking, and uh, God bless you in the next event. Amen, David. God bless you. Thank you. All right. Great to see you. All right, friends. Thanks so much again for your support of the podcast and for sharing. God bless you. And as always, keep speaking the truth about things that matter.